For a long time, the moon was considered scientifically exhausted. No astronauts flew to the moon for almost 50 years, and there were hardly any other exciting projects or discoveries around the Earth's satellite. But this changed abruptly in the last few years. Since the Chinese are on the advance on the moon, also the interest of NASA increases again. In 2020 came the sensational message. The Chinese lander Chang'e 5 had discovered enormous water reservoirs on the moon. In this video, we take a closer look at what this means for us on Earth and for the future of the moon, and we explain how water is made from glass. Water in glass beads. Researchers have known for about 20 years that there is water on the moon. Although this discovery was astonishing, after all, scientists assumed for a long time that the moon was dry as dust. It was not initially regarded as the big sensation in scientific circles. The first water reservoirs were found at the south pole of the moon. Scientifically, this was not the surprise either because in the meantime, astronomers had discovered frozen water ice on Mars as well and on some other moons in the solar system. It wasn't until China's Chang'e 5 lander first took samples from deeper layers of the moon's rock in 2020 that the international scientific community took notice. Chang'e 5 was and is an exceptional project in Chinese spaceflight. The lander flew to the moon together with an orbiter. Thanks to cutting-edge drilling technology, the rover was able to bore its way into the depths of the moon in a similar way to its NASA counterparts on Mars. What was particularly exciting about this mission was not only taking the samples, but also sending them back to Earth. The first major lunar mission for the Chinese was a resounding success, and it continued directly with a successful analysis of the rocks. The Chang'e 5 Mission The Chinese Chang'e 5 lunar mission was only the second unmanned project in the long history of lunar exploration to send lunar rocks back to Earth. The last time this happened was more than 45 years ago with the Soviet Luna mission. And of course, the Apollo astronauts also brought rocks back to Earth. The lander was named after a Chinese moon goddess. Although there is, of course, some competition among space agencies around the world, people around the world were pleased with the huge success of the Chinese. On November 24, 2020, the double probe had set off into space. After a short stay in lunar orbit, the moon goddess landed on the moon on Tuesday, December 1st. Piloted from Earth, Chang'e 5 searched the lunar soil for a suitable landing and drilling site. After drilling was complete, the rover transferred the sample to an ascent model and it was intercepted by an orbiter. A Mars rock retrieval mission by NASA is expected to proceed in a very similar manner in a few years. The mission was followed with excitement around the world and the European Space Agency, ESA, was particularly proud as the Europeans had contributed to the Chang'e 5's development. What news did the investigations bring? The samples were examined by researchers from China's Nanjing University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. One sample consisted of just 150 regolith granules. Each individual piece of the sample measured between 50 micrometers and about one millimeter. Regolith is a very common rock in the solar system. What you see on the moon even the lunar dust is basically regolith. Mars is also covered by regolith. On the red planet, the rock is unusually ferruginous, and presumably it has oxidized there due to the influence of atmospheric moisture, resulting in the typical red color of Mars. On the moon, the rock is consistently gray. The fine lunar dust is nothing else than pulverized regolith which was ground very fine by numerous impacts of meteorites and asteroids. Due to chemical interactions and the tremendous force of the impacts, the lunar dust is altered in a very specific way. 
It contains irritating substances and razor-sharp small particles. The astronauts of NASA's Apollo missions had to experience firsthand that lunar dust has a lot to offer. The sharp dust particles destroyed the zippers of the spacesuits, and adhesions that traveled to Earth with the spacesuits triggered severe allergic reactions among the astronauts and even among the ground personnel who cleaned the suits. However, Chang'e found another peculiarity in the moon rocks. The impacts of large celestial bodies have created tiny glass spheres in the regolith dust, and these contain water. How does the water get into the glass? It's exciting news. Just the idea that there is water enclosed in glass all over the lunar dust is fascinating. Researchers calculated that all the water trapped in the moon dust could be enough to create large lakes or rivers. So do we now have to revise our image of dust-dry celestial bodies? It looks quite so, because probably there is still far more water on the moon than assumed so far. According to the analysis of the Chinese scientists, 120 parts per million consist of hydroxyl or pure H2O. The lunar soil probably contains between 120 and 180 grams of water per ton, whereby we cannot yet say with certainty whether the concentration of water on the moon is evenly distributed. How did this water come into being? There is currently only one conclusive explanation. Solar winds carry hydrogen directly from the solar atmosphere across the solar system. Through physical and chemical reactions, tiny amounts of water are formed in the glass beads contained in the lunar rock. Chemists call this process diffusion. Calculations have shown that more than 270 billion liters of water could be stored on the moon in this way. The glass beads, in turn, were created during massive impacts. Through the heat and the friction, the minerals in the moon rock are converted into glass. Heiju Hoi, a researcher from Nanjing University involved in the study, told US news channel CNN that the glass beads are distributed globally on the moon. It would even be conceivable to set a functioning water cycle in motion on the moon through appropriate artificial influences. Even more water on the moon. But that was far from all the Chinese scientists discovered because the samples Chang'e 5 took showed something else. About 60 particles per million showed traces of water that were probably not produced by solar winds but came from inside the moon. Scientists now believe that there are even larger amounts of water in deep rock layers of the moon. Interestingly, researchers of antiquity also, as well as astrologers, associated the moon with the element of water for many thousands of years. This seemed downright crazy to the conservative science of the present day. But now this picture is changing, and modern astrophysics and astrochemists are wondering whether the scholars of antiquity knew something about the moon that remained hidden from our modern research until a few years ago. However, the water deposits on the moon are not about being right or about a comparison with ancient astrology, but about a very practical use. The moon moves again into the center of space travel. That's right, NASA again plans manned flights to the moon. In the context of the Artemis mission, the moon is even to be settled in the coming decades. In the even further future, the moon is to become a base station for space travelers who, among other things, will make the long journey to Mars. There are also plans to use the moon for tourism and industry. Water on site would simplify all these plans enormously. For example, plant cultivation in special facilities would also be possible on the moon. For some time now, a greenhouse has been tested in Antarctica that is designed to withstand extreme cosmic situations. On Eden ISS, radishes, tomatoes, peas, and other plants thrive under artificial growing conditions. The Moon at the Center of Space Travel Last year, after many postponements, NASA launched the Artemis test run to the Moon. 
The first manned flight is then scheduled to take place in 2024. However, the construction of a lunar station is not expected before 2030. If you follow our channel regularly or are one of our subscribers, you probably know that not only NASA wants to go to the moon again, multi-billionaires Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk also want to use the moon. While Musk has mainly tourist plans and wants to build a lunar hotel, Bezos dreams of industrial facilities on the moon. The presence of water also makes these plans more tangible. We can also be sure that the Chinese space industry will not miss out on the race to colonize the moon. The fact that the space agencies are now getting serious is demonstrated by numerous international projects in which researchers and creative minds are developing complete concepts for lunar houses and settlements. With the international architectural group Foster & Partners, ESA has already developed fantastic concepts for future lunar homes. Germany is also working on lunar settlements. Among other things, scientists of the Center for Applied Space Technology in Bremen compile complete life concepts for moon settlers. NASA is currently also already in the process of finding medical personnel for space missions. There are concrete application and selection procedures for the future space doctors. So, it will probably only be a matter of time before the first settlers set off for the moon. After the video ends, let us know in the comments if you have what it takes to be a lunar settler. But now, we'll take a look at how the water from the moon rocks can be made usable again in the first place. Water from glass. That's how easy it is. Each glass bead should be able to absorb about 0.002 grams of water for each gram of its mass. The amount of water stored in the moon rock alone is roughly equivalent to the water volume of Lake Constance. For lunar conditions, this is a lot, and presumably there is still much more water in the depths of the moon. The question of how the water from the glass beads can be made usable for people on the moon was answered quite simply by the Chinese scientist, Heju Hoi, with the words, by heating. Thus, it would take nothing more than a burner or heat source with the appropriate power to produce water on the moon. This could be available to space travelers and lunar settlers as drinking and service water. It would allow plants to grow, and one can even obtain cheap fuel from water. All that is needed is normal water and CO2. The resulting fuel can even power rockets. Incredible, but true. Currently, even car companies and industry are working on the climate-friendly water fuels. Exciting questions remain about how lunar space travel will continue, when the first settlers will fly to the moon, and whether we will really have moon hotels soon. Maybe you already have suitable answers to these questions. As always, we welcome your feedback and ideas in the comments. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time at Simply Space.